My name is Allison Lechner, and I am the Events and Membership Manager here at MOCA GA. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce you guys to Krista Clark. So Krista Clark grew up in Burlington, Vermont, and holds a BFA from Atlanta College of Art and Printmaking, a MA from New York University, and an MFA from Georgia State University. Her work has been exhibited at the High Museum, Atlanta Contemporary, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and has been shown in on, an ongoing exhibition at Bratislava, Slovakia, through art in embassies. She was a 2012 Hambage Fellow. Krista is represented by the Sandler Hudson Gallery here in Atlanta. Seen, yeah, both of you are here. Um, she lives and works in West, the Westview neighborhood of Atlanta, and her work draws moments between presence and absence in the historic West End Atlanta as the city's sprawl changes the landscape. So without further ado, please welcome Krista Clark. Oh, also, Hello. at okay. the end, if you have questions, flag me down, and I'll give you the mic. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna have to get used to this microphone. Um, so first off, thank you to all of you for coming. And um, a special thank you to everyone who engaged in conversations with me recently about the work. It's really those discussions that helped, at least initially helped me organize my um, thoughts around the work. So. Um, truly, thank you for those conversations. Um, so just a kind of a quick introduction, or just to kind of bring us back to last September, last summer, last June, um, and thinking about the work in terms of how I wanted to organize this show, um, there were two things that I was certain about um, that were, were my anchors and preparing and planning for what I wanted to do. Um, and one of, is this okay, is this, okay. I'm not used to this. Um, uh, so one of those anchors was that I knew I wanted to create a project that would highlight the conversation between my works on paper, which are, um, have now become drywall, at least for the moment, um, and then also my installations. Um, and then the other kind of linchpin was I knew I wanted to create a floor installation um, because all of my previous works, all of my previous installations have been anchored to the wall. So I knew that I wanted to come completely off the wall and engage the, the actual space um, and, not, and not hold on to the wall anymore because of, you know, that is what I'm most familiar with and most comfortable with. So really wanted to use this opportunity um, to, to work with that challenge. Um, so from there, so it was nice to kind of have, to have those two angers, to know that I wanted those two aspects to function in the work. Um, and then from there, I was trying to determine um, what kind of platform I wanted that floor installation to take. So at one point it was going to be, um, I had thought about making it a stage. Um, and so I was thinking, kind of investigating just ways of, um, ways of presentation. And actually that, that investigation has led me um, now to, I'm, I'm interested in those different modes of presentation that I've starting to kind of explore and pieces that I'm making now. Um, so at one point it was, I was thinking that there would be this kind of this large stage, so just one giant platform in the middle of the room. Um, and that platform, the focus of that would be the scaffolding kind of beneath that stage. Um, and then another iteration was I thought about creating um, this, tr creating this space and making it into um, a sense of a pop-up. And that came from this experience that I think we have all had of traversing um, 
familiar spaces every day, and it actually happened to me today. Um, but going every day to these places that you're familiar with, and then all of a sudden you're in this place, or it seems like it's all of a sudden, but all of a sudden you're in this place and you're in this foreign space, but at the same time it's familiar because it's been, it's been changed in some way because of, because as we, you know, we know that our built environment is constantly changing. So just um, thinking about the show as a pop-up in that way. Um, so I think that is, has, that idea has somewhat carried over, but eventually <clears throat> I settled on focusing on the platforms, um, eventually became these foundations that you all see. Um, so that are the, fa they're the foundations and they're actually the foundation for the exhibition. Um, so the materials, the focus was on these wood, form, wood and concrete forms. Um, and they are the foundation and they are also the bookend for the work and they're the bookend for this transitional space that I um, have been interested in with my, with, throughout my work um, that I'll come back around to later. But um, I'm going to, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do this with the microphone. <laughs> Um, that's okay. <laughs> it's kind of, it's a few, so I'm going to read, um, thank you though. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a few excerpts um, from, this is Art on My Mind, Visual Politics, um, and it's by Bell Hooks. And it's a book that has, it's special to me, um, and it's been in my collection. Um, and it's special to me, one, just because Bell Hooks is one of my um, favorite writers. Um, and it's also special because I've, um, when I acquired this book, my sister and I <clears throat> saw, had the opportunity of hearing Bell Hook speak. Um, and so it was um, at that time that I, was that I was able to acquire this book. And I've referenced it often. There are a couple of chapters that I've gone back to often um, throughout the years. But this particular chapter that I'm going to read from just a few excerpts from, um, I completely overlooked. Um, and so, again, going back to last summer when I was planning, just trying to gather my thoughts for my work in general and thinking about how I wanted to um, situate the work in the show, it was actually um, reading from another book that directed me and led me back to this specific chapter um, in visual politics. And, I hope it's not too long, but I think it's worth it. So the title of the chapter is called Black Vernacular, Architecture as Cultural Practice. <clears throat> Designing the house of my dreams in a high school art class, I did not think any decisions I made were political. Indeed, every thought I had about the aesthetics of this project was rooted in imaginative fantasy, beginning with the idea of a world of unlimited freedom where space, and in particular living space, could be designed solely in relation to desire. I greatly wanted most to move away from concrete political realities, such as class and just dream. When we were given the assignment to build a house, our art teacher encouraged us to forget about dwellings as we knew them, and to think imaginatively about, state, about space, about the link between what we desire, dream about, and what is practical. We were to design, as I understood it, a dwelling place of dreams. I began this assignment by making a list of all the aspects of a house I found most compelling. Stairways, window seats, hidden nooks and crannies. On paper, my house exposed and revealed my obsessions. I was a constant reader living with a huge family in a small space. To me, reading was a deliciously private experience, one that allowed me to be secluded, walled in by silence and thought. In my dream house, there were many places designed to enhance the pleasure of reading. Places for sitting and lying down, places for reading and reverie. 
every bit of space was shaped to be subordinate to these desires. Thus, there were endless stairways, window seats, and small rooms everywhere. On paper, in structure, and design, the house I imagined was a place for the fulfillment of desire, a place with no sense of, necessary, of necessity. It fascinates me now to think about why a white male Italian immigrant high school art teacher from the, in the, in the segregated South would encourage students to think, art, to think of artistic practice solely in relation to fantasy and desire. In retrospect, it is clear that this was precisely the kind of assignment that was meant to deflect attention from political realities, from the class, race, and gender differences that separated and divided us from one another. Even though I did not see myself as thinking politically then, the very fact that I designed my dream house to counter the, to counter the experience of growing up in small, overcrowded space a circumstance that reflected my family's economic standing meant that undergirding my dreams, my fantasies, and desires were class-based longings. This dream house, then, was not solely the outcome of abstract musings about dwellings. It was equally rooted in a concrete acknowledgment of my reality. Despite its limitations, this assignment did teach us that irrespective of our location, irrespective of class, race, and gender, we were all capable of inventing, transforming, making space. Hang in there. It is empowering for me to construct in writing the continuum that exists between the exploration of space and architecture that was a fundamental aspect of poor, poor black rural southern life, even though it was not articulated in those terms. When my father's father, Daddy Jerry, a sharecropper cropper, and farmer, talked in concrete terms about his relationship to land, his longing to own and build, he spoke poetically about working with space so that it would reveal and mirror the texture of his longings. I never understood how Daddy Jerry came by a piece of land. That was the way folks talked about it then. The phrase could define a number of transactions. It could mean that he bought, traded, inherited, or exchanged work for land. On this land, Daddy Jerry built a house. I can still remember the way he and my father would sit on the porch and have deep discussions about that house. Their talk evoked a poetics of space, the joy of thinking imaginatively about one's dwelling. And I can recall my disappointment when I finally saw the small square brick house that he built. In my childhood imagination, this space seemed so utterly closed and tight. Had I understood the interconnected politics of race, gender, and class in the white supremacist South, I would have looked upon this house with the same awe as I did my favorite house. My awe was reserved for the house of my mother's father, Daddy Gus, and her mother, Baba, an artist quilt maker Baba shaped this house to meet her needs, those of her husband of more than 70 years, and the extended family that stayed or visited there. Like Toni Morrison's fictional character, character Ava Peace in Song of Solomon, <clears throat> Baba's wood frame dwelling was a place where rooms were continuously added in odd places, tacked on, usually to accommodate the desires of the individual who was destined to inhabit that space. At Baba's house, there was always an excitement about space, a sense of possibility. Their dwellings were seen as in constant state of change. Significantly, the absence of material privilege, priv ma significantly, the absence of material privilege did not mean that poor and working class back black folks, such as my grandparents, did not think creatively about space. While lack of material privilege limited what could be done with surroundings, it was nevertheless always possible to make changes. My grandmother's house was not unlike the small shacks that were the homes of many Southern black folks. Her place was just a bigger, more elegant shack. Wood frame dwellings that were fragile or sturdy shaped my sense of meaningful vernacular architecture. Many of these structures, though fragile and therefore altered by time and the elements, 
remain and offer a wealth of information about the relationship of poor and working class rural black folks to space. African American professor of architecture, Wells Bowie highlights in her writing the significance of architecture created by folks who were not schooled in the profession or even in the arts of building. She offers the insights that vernacular architecture is a language of cultural expression that exemplifies how the physical environment reflects the, uni the uniqueness of a culture. Little railroad shacks in the South were often peopled by large families. Often the rural black folks who lived in shacks on the edges and margins of town conceptualize the yard as a continuation of living space. Careful attention might be given to the planting of flowers, the positioning of a porch or a rope, hope, of a rope hung swing. Often exploited or ex oppressed groups of people who are compelled by economic circumstance to share small living quarters with many others view the world right, south, right outside their housing structure as liminal space where they can stretch the limits of desire and the imagination. So here's where it gets dicey because I can't rely on bell hooks <laughs> words and I have to rely on my own words. Um, but um, what I uh, um, take from that is um, that Hooks is speaking about occupying space and creating space in a way that defies the norm. Um, and that she's talking about this idea of um, challenging that there is this notion that there is a correct way just to exist in space and be in space. Um, and then also with that challenging this assumption that there is this hierarchy of aesthetic um, that I'll kind of come back to. Um, but for me, this leads me to, so back to um, speaking about the foundations as being this bookend to this transitional space. So if you've um, talked to me about my work um, ever, <laughs> um, I always will mention this, this in-between space, this transitional space that has existed from um, when I was doing primarily purely um, drawings on paper, um, pen and ink and graphite um, to the work that I'm doing now. So this transitional space has been that constant thread um, throughout the work and it may have shifted um, in different ways in terms of where I was even personally in my life. So um, even as an artist, just trying to defy conventions in terms of um, how one is should live their life. Um, so it's been, it's, it's a very familiar, this in-between space is a very familiar place for me, which I'm sure is for, for all of us in some ways. Um, and so thinking of this, this transitional space, this in-between space is just as Bell Hooks um, speaks about is this place for possibility. It's this place that allows for other conclusions that, um, that defy the norm, um, other conclusions that, um, that challenge infrastructure and challenge um, aesthetics. Um, and so in terms of that, so this entire exhibition, this entire show is about that, that transitional space. It's about that. Um, being in that space that shifts between being neither, it's not located in any specific place. Um, but in particular, for me, actually this partition here in the middle of the room um, operates in different ways. Um, one in that it shifts back and forth between, you, you don't really know really what it's framing. Um, so is it framing an interior, an exterior? Um, and then it's kind of haphazardly sitting on this um, foundation that is maybe a platform or um, and that functions differently than the concrete foundations. Um, but for me, it's just as importantly this, um, I may have called it a platform, I meant to say partition. I don't know if I did. Um, so this partition here is um, meant to honor that space that Bell, Hicks, Bell Hooks refers to. Um, so that extended living space. Um, so that living space that begins in the house but then extends and 
seeps out of that living room and onto the porch and into the yard. Um, and so just that quiet way of acknowledging different ways of, of using space and being in space, um, you know, I think that that is just even, just thinking of space in that way is just a, a, um, a small deviation to the norm to some extent. Um, it's a disruption. Um, and so thinking about, so coming back to um, this idea of the aesthetic um, and this hierarchy of aesthetic, um, for me, so I'm, I'm interested in, a lot of the artists that I look at are, are, um, are work within minimalism. Um, and for me, I have this kind of, I love but also want to undermine um, the, very, the rigidness of that, um, of that aesthetic. And I actually um, kind of unofficially titled this talk um, Minimalism, the Quest for Order, which I ripped from a Whitney catalog. Um, and if it was written down, I'd probably put a, um, a strike through that. Um, so for me, thinking about the work in relation to minimalism, um, and how it either references minimalism, minimalism or deviates um, is helpful just to, th to think about how it op is operating in this space. Um, so in thinking about the principal aspects of minimalism, I'm mainly um, focusing on this idea of repetition through um, order through repetition. So for example, um, and also this idea of these manufactured forms. Um, so here in this space, um, there are seven platforms that are surrounding you. Um, and the size of those platforms were dictated by this manufactured four by eight sheet of plywood. Um, and then that four by eight, eight sheet um, plywood dictated the size of the concrete. Um, and then you have the, um, the stacks or the leaning um, sheets of um, drywall behind you. Um, and then over here, you have um, a quarter size of these concrete slabs, poured concrete slabs um, that are two feet by four feet um, that also are, are stacked in repetition. Um, but then within that, you have this um, disruption from this light that is highlighting um, the irregularities within that stack. So it's no longer um, what I appreciated, um, Claire Dempster, I always want to say Dempsey. Um, so Claire Dempster wrote a very thoughtful, lovely article about the show and Burn Away um, and mentioned um, you know, that these are all of the materials, with the exception of the wall pieces, um, all of the materials are their raw form, of their raw form. Um, but you, you see my hand um, in the work and Aaron's hand. <laughs> um, and so, so I am in no way trying to um, create any type of illusion in the making of the work. Um, so unlike Donald Judd's work and others, um, so with his um, you know, his, his boxes of concrete and steel and, and wood. Um, as Claire mentioned, you know, there, you see that the fabric, you don't see the hand in, the, um, in those materials and you feel the fabrication, the industrial aspect of those. Um, and so that doesn't exist here. Um, even though I, I feel it's, I'm um, pointing to that. But um, so where, where those distinctions, um, the commonalities and the distinctions between those, I think is that's the space that I'm interested in. The disruption that is created, um, that, that is there to, um, to undermine that quest for order. Um, and you, so you see that um, disruption most obviously um, in the blue tarp. Um, and so for me, 
So the, the tarp was actually one of the last materials that um, I added to the space. Um, and I was, and I've worked with the tarp with different types of tarps often. Um, so I've worked with them in ways of collage with my paperworks and then more assemblage and, and even in the installations. Um, but when I went to add it to this space, um, I kind of was like, I don't really, ugh. it's just so, um, I did not know how I was going to like how, the weight of this tarp in the space um, and the weight of it physically and psychologically. Um, so it's the, really, with the exception of the fan um, and a few other small areas of color, um, it's the only really you know, potent um, aspect of color in the space. Um, and it's, it's so organic, it's so, um, and so it made me feel very uncomfortable because of um, this, this torn material and um, connection or um, in contrast to these, these cleaner geometric forms. Um, and at the same time, I knew that the tarp had to be in the space for exactly that reason, to create that disruption in, um, in this order. Um, Something else I was going to say with that, I believe, but. <laughs> um, so it, the, my work is also about, it's really, um, it's just about exploration of materials as well, um, always, um, and the love of the materials. Um, someone asked, you know, you know, why these materials? And initially, it was these materials because um, because I was trying to remain true to, to this site, to this, um, this constructed, not necessarily construction, but constructed site. Um, and so I didn't really choose the, those materials. Those, are, those were the appropriate materials for the work. Um, and so in terms of making the decisions, in terms of how things came together, I was trying to remain true to that process. So true to the process of a poured foundation. Um, and I would have to pull back in terms of making decisions and, um, that were primarily about my aesthetic. Um, and what I really did not want to do is um, I did not want it to be decorative, um, so so I really wanted um, the process to dictate the process and the actual function of the forms to dictate um, how the work was made. Um, so, for example, looking at um, the, the the concrete forms, the corners don't come to these crisp, clean edges because, um, in reality those would just be temporary, um, and then those would be removed. So it's, it's a mold, <laughs> um, and so in reality, that would, you know, would not remain. So there would be no reason to have this, these clean corners. Um, and so I wanted to also contrast that with these other three um, forms with the wood tops that have the, these cleaner, this cleaner construction that also is, um, are meant to operate in a different way. Um, also just kind of referencing that interior space. Um, but going back to the use of materials, um, so I'm interested in these materials. I have a love for these materials um, and exploring um, the relationship of them and also just pushing how um, pushing their, their characteristics and um, different aspects of them. And notably, you see that um, exploration most in um, these wall works. Um, and that is one, because that is my um, language that I'm most comfortable with. Um, so it comes from this language of drawing. And so I know I'm comfortable with pushing those materials in a way that is familiar with, with me, to me. Um, and so that becomes less so in the installation. Um, and again, that just goes back to, um, I didn't want to embellish the materials and that I wanted to leave those um, in their raw state. Again, just to remain true to, to that site of um, 
construction um, and and making. Um, I know that there's something else that I'm forgetting, but um, I think there's more that I had to say, but <laughs> it's left. Um, but if you all have any questions, um, I will open it up for questions. Gavin. Hello. Oh, okay. I will say one more thing. Sorry. <laughs> um, so just going back in terms of not wanting to b embellish, um, I rather than adding um, other things to the surface of um, to the materials, I instead wanted to so consistent with how I approach the works on paper, um, the collage pieces, I wanted to instead rely on um, acts within, acts with the, um, with the material. So meaning um, the way things are stacked, or things are, are leaning, um, the way that the tarp is draping, or the way that this um, window here is leaning and pressing up against the partition. So I wanted to rely more so on um, those gestures rather than embellishing um, the materials. That's all. Uh, it's, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement, but I'll just start talking and Statements see what comes good. out. Um, first of all, God, I hate this. I <laughs> see, it's not fun. <laughs> um, I also have a love for these materials. Um, side note, I'm going through the process of doing my house and you have a relationship with these, I have a relationship with these materials, um, especially because they're unseen materials for the most part, like they exist in the home, but it's not really the focal point. So um, it was beautiful for me to see them in this light in the pure way, like when I'm going to Home Depot and getting them, I see this, I pick up the four, the, the four by eight sheets of uh, um, sheet rock and so it's something that I'm always in connection with, but not in the same way. So that was beautiful to see, um, especially all of the elements in their raw forms. Um, I love the talk too, and I love this idea of stillness, um, especially going back to be like in the middle of construction. It's a hard place to be where something's unfinished and potential and I felt like the potential in this and the stillness and the movement of it. Um, yeah, and just the, I don't know, there's something really beautiful just about the, the materials are the materials. And it's just the hand touch with it. Um, like I'm seeing the flip side of this piece turned around like it's in the walls and it's all these materials which are already in this space and just seen it in a different way. So I just really enjoyed that. That's it, sorry. Thanks, Gavin. Hi, Krista. Hi, Morgan. This is beautiful. Thank you. Um, can you talk about the actual like creating of these pieces? Like, how was that process when you got into this space? How did you how did you create this? <laughs> um, so all of the the only thing that was made in the space, or I should probably reverse that. <laughs> um, so the containers, I should say, um, or um, the platforms were all built with um, the help of, um, and I should really, so Aaron Putt <laughs> helped me a great deal, um, and he's also known as the master mixer, um, <laughs> but he um, helps, um, so I have to, um, share, say thank you um, to Aaron. Um, but with the help of Aaron, <laughs> uh, the, the platforms were, were built in the studio um, and the smaller kind of these quarter size slabs that you see here, those were poured in the studio. Um, the partition um, we built here and um, the majority of that um, kind of entranceway doorway was for the most, there was just one aspect um, that I finished up here. Um, but all of the 
the concrete forms um, we poured here in the space. Um, and I don't know if that's what you meant in terms of the yeah, making of the work. Um, yes. <laughs> So in terms of, um, so our meaning in terms of like placement and where things are in relation to each other, or sp specifically that. Um, I, kn I knew that I wanted to have this corner piece, this partition that would, um, so for the m most part, so all of the objects, I didn't want to have any objects that were sitting fully on the form. Um, and so I knew I wanted to use that piece to activate um, this kind of empty space um, and also to shift um, particularly that piece there, the, um, the wood top, because um, I don't really necessarily think of those fully as foundations. They're something else for me that I still don't quite know. Um, but so I knew I, I wanted to use that partition to shift um, those foundations into like just into different spaces. Um, and I and also just the precarity of having it um, hang off the um, off of these foundations, these platforms into the space. Um, so that is so a lot of the, also the other decisions that I make um, is again about um, these gestures, but then wanting to create this kind of, um, this space is kind of unsteady to some extent. Davion? Oh, Tony. <laughs> Hi, Krista. Hi, Tony. Um, I thought it was interesting how you um, referred to the works behind you as works on paper because I'm familiar with your works on paper but right. this is a it, it's it's also uh, you know you could see your hand in terms of drawing yet not yet necessarily using the charcoal or the erasure of, 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 of what you did in the past mm -hmm. can you uh, touch upon about some of the elements like the the curls which are some something new and I saw the there's a lot of seeping going on not only in the works on paper but also within the um, the, the, the platforms, I just wanted to... Did you say seeping? Seeping mm. materials, yeah. Mm. Um, so, so these were actually, and I, um, so these were originally going to be works on paper and then through the process, um, they transitioned into um, drywall. Um, and so when I decided that I wanted them to be drywall, I didn't want to just use the surface of the drywall. I really wanted to um, explore um, what that what that particular material had to offer. Um, so, in terms of carving into it, um, which also was really exciting for me because when I started carving into it, that brought I have a background in printmaking, and so that carving um, was and that I I don't really. I don't do printmaking so much anymore, even though it very much informs my process. Um, but so that, that carving felt very familiar and it was nice and slowed my process down also. Uh, the, I also, um, and this is, I have maybe like five or six of these that I started. Um, <laughs> so this is the second um, kind of version of these drywall works. Um, and I really tried to really, not just for the drywall works, but for the entire installation, distill the materials down to just um, a few edited, curated materials. Um, and that was because with installations that I've done in the past, I have often felt like I threw in everything except the, <laughs> the kitchen sink just because just exploring and playing with and so I really wanted to um, to edit that and be um, conscious of what materials I was as, was using um, and so so there's this carving um, and one reason why I wanted to have this opportunity to show the 
the drawings or the works on paper or the, the works on drywall is because for me they are these um, they are they are these architectural spaces um, but they've been abstracted um, to the point that if you were to come upon them you wouldn't necessarily with the exception of the actual materials materials themselves the compositions don't always reference architectural space um, and so I wanted um, to have that conversation between these works, between the, the wall works and the installation so that they could kind of have that inform each other back and forth. And there was something else I was gonna say with that, but I forget. Okay. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes, Heather. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about presence or absence of the artist's hand. Um, as I look around, it looks like some of the forms and services look like they were intentionally kept kind of pristine and some of them made to look weathered or distressed. And it's my assumption that most of them started out as pristine and you have altered or manipulated them. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So, <laughs> was there a question there? So familiar. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so was your Heather and I go way back? <laughs> we used to be carpool buddies. I'm gonna just come on over there. <laughs> so, um, are you asking? So, in terms of how, what did I, how did I chose to leave the hand? I think that that decision is made through when I'm putting the materials together. Um, and so if it feels, and I never, um, so whenever I'm making a mark, um, I'm generally not doing it to create some type of um, distress into the, on, to the material. So that the material generally comes to me with that. Um, so my, I guess, intervention with the material is more so in terms of, I guess, bringing my language of, of composition and drawing to that material. Um, and just thinking about, again, that relationship um, and if things are, are f I'm more interested in um, if things are being removed or if they're falling or if they're being, um, what is layered on top, what is, so I guess that, that is where my interest is. Yeah. Thank you, oh, yes. <laughs> Hi, um, I came in and you were talking about the aesthetic hierarchy, I believe. Um, is your intention to disrupt it, to disrupt that hierarchy? It is. Why do you feel like that's necessary? Um, so I guess, so with that, which I didn't go into very much intentionally. <laughs> um, so it is my intention, I think, to disrupt that hierarchy of minimalism because, so one, um, I love minimalism, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, and so in one way I'm trying to, I am, 
I guess I feel kind of guilty about that love. Um, and it's, it's guilty um, for the parts of, uh, that are the dominant parts of that. So that it represents this sense of power, this, um, you know, staking claim to, to this space or this, this industrial use of this materials is very, um, can feel very aggressive. Um, and so it's those parts that I um, shun, but then at the same time, I'm, you know, I feel also feel guilty or complicit, complicit in that that is also kind of my aesthetic as well. Is that? Um, if anybody has any additional questions, I think we'll we'll take away the mics. If you just want to hang out and love on Krista, we are all about that. So thanks, you all.